In the branch of electrical engineering that educates on power and energy systems, there's a concept called symmetrical components that allows an engineer to study unbalanced sinusoidal signals that could represent voltages or currents. The electrical engineer learns to transform these signals into a set of vectors that exist in the complex plane, and these can then be transformed into other complex-valued vectors that can be enormously helpful when solving power engineering problems. However, if you're already confused, then you're not alone. Many engineers studying this topic may be able to solve problems, but never understand exactly what's happening when this last step occurs. In this video, I want to show this topic from a new angle and reveal some little known triangle geometry that can help provide a deeper intuition into what these mysterious vectors are and how they got there. First, I think it's always helpful to have a little history to put things into context for any viewers who may not know anything about power grids. In 1800, Alessandro Volta invented the battery, and over the next few decades many other scientists used this invention to investigate electricity and its relationship to magnetic fields and light. Once electromagnetic theory had been firmly established, power grids began to develop. The earliest power grids in the 1870s and 1880s used direct current, or DC, which provides a constant signal to power the electrical load. Then in 1886, William Stanley demonstrated the first large power grid using alternating current, or AC. AC provides a sinusoidal signal that can be transformed into higher or lower voltages, which enables longer range power transmission. Then in 1887, Nikola Tesla patented the first two-phase AC power system. This used two sinusoidal signals separated by one quarter of a wavelength, which allowed for controlled rotation in electric motors. Finally, in 1891, Mikhail Dolovo Dobrovolsky demonstrated the first three-phase AC power grid. This used three signals separated by one-third of a cycle. Three phases could transmit more power with less wires and had more stable motors, but was mathematically difficult to manage. It wasn't until Charles Fortescue developed the theory of symmetrical components in 1918 that three phases became the dominant type of power grid used worldwide. To get started on symmetrical components, let's go back to a single AC signal, which I'll call a voltage for the remainder of the video. All of the information about a sinusoidal voltage can be mapped onto the complex plane. The height of the voltage wave represents the length of the complex valued vector. Any shift in the sine wave to the left or right changes the phase, which rotates the vector around its origin. Notice that as the wave moves across the whole of its wavelength, the vector rotates a full 360 degrees. This vector is normally called a phasor because it encodes the phase of the wave. Now let's look at a two-phase power system this time with the peaks of the two voltages separated by one half of a cycle. Like before, these waves can be mapped onto the complex plane as phasors, and the half cycle separation results in a 180 degree separation between the phasors. As the two voltage waves are shifted in time, so too do the phasors maintain their 180 degree separation as they rotate around. How would we describe unbalance between two uneven phasors I'll call VA and VB? One thing we could try to do is take the average of the two phasors. I'll call this average the V0 component of the system. Since VB is rotated 180 degrees in complex space, it sits on the negative side of the number line, and so its magnitude is negative. Therefore, the V0 calculation just takes the difference of the lengths of the two phasors. The result is the distance between the phasor origin and the midpoint of the VA-VB line. Another way to measure unbalance between VA and VB is to first rotate the VB phasor 180 degrees and then take the average again. I'll call this value V1 and it describes the average of the magnitudes of VA and VB. This calculation provides the distance from the midpoint of the system to the end of the VA VB line. Now for the three phase case. With three phases, there's a choice of how to order the voltage waves. The order can either be green, red, blue, or ABC, as shown on the left, or green, blue, red, ACB, as shown on the right. These two options can be thought of as the reverse of each other, because moving backwards across the ABC waves gives the order ACB, and vice versa. So how can unbalance in a three-phase system be described? Like before, the V0 component takes the average of the three phasors and finds the line to the geometric center of the system. To find the geometric center of a triangle, trace a line from each of the triangle's corners to the midpoint of the opposing side. The intersection of these lines gives the geometric center of the triangle, called the centroid. 
The V0 phaser is just the line connecting the phaser origin to the centroid. Note that as the magnitude and phase of V0 change, the shape of the triangle stays the same. The triangle is only translated across the plane. In this way, V0 records the translation symmetry of the system. To build a complete understanding of three-phase imbalance, it helps to look at the two-phase case in the imaginary plane. For two phases, operations were performed on VA and VB that used roots of unity of 1, specifically 1 and minus 1. These two values mapped onto the complex plane form a line. In the three-phase case, the third roots of unity are used, which trace out a triangle in the complex plane. These roots can be multiplied against VA, VB, and VC to find V1, the value that represents the amount of ABC rotation in the system. To link this back to reality, the V1 value measures the amount that a motor would rotate in a specific direction, which in this example is counterclockwise. V1 is used to create a set of three phasers V1A, V1B, and V1C that have the same magnitude and are 120 degrees apart from each other. To find the measure of ACB rotation in the system, the previous equation is used again, but VB and VC switch places. This measure is called V2 and gives the amount of clockwise rotation in the motor example. Like before, V2 is used to create three other phasers that have opposite rotation from the V1 phasers. Starting with a balanced ABC system with V1 equal to 1 and V2 equal to 0, slowly increasing the amount of ACB rotation will cause the original triangle to slowly collapse, eventually forming a line when the two rotations are equal. As the V1 component is reduced and the V2 component dominates, the original triangle develops an ACB rotation. It's interesting to see what happens when the magnitudes of V1 and V2 are non-zero and don't change, but their relative angle does change. Initially, with a relative angle of zero, the triangle takes on an isosceles shape with two sides equal and longer than the third side. Rotating V2 60 degrees creates an isosceles triangle with two sides shorter than the third side. As V2 rotates, every 60 degrees the original triangle alternately takes one of these two isosceles shapes. Also, all of the triangles shown here have the same area. Rotating V2 around 360 degrees gives every possible triangle with the given area that we started with. So at this point, it may seem like I covered V1 and V2 pretty thoroughly, but there's still a reason to be dissatisfied with this explanation. I haven't given a geometric interpretation of these two components like I did for V0. So now I'd like to show you that. For this explanation, it's better to focus on the side lengths of the VA, VB, VC phasor triangle rather than on the phasors themselves. I selected my favorite example, which is the triangle with side lengths 1, 2, 2. First, erect external equilateral triangles off the sides of the phasor triangle, and then connect the center of these three new triangles. This is a construction known as a Napoleon triangle, specifically the outer Napoleon triangle, and it has a special property that it is always equilateral, meaning that all three of its sides are always the same length. Rotating this Napoleon triangle 180 degrees results in the triangle for V1, and the three V1 phasers can be recovered. To find V2, start with the original triangle again. Erect internal equilateral triangles off the sides, and then connect the center of these three new triangles. This gives the construction of the inner Napoleon triangle. Rotating the inner Napoleon triangle 180 degrees recovers the V2 phasers. Now I'd like to qualify why I said that this was my favorite example. The 1, 2, 2 triangle produces the V1 and V2 triangles with side lengths of the golden ratio and the inverse golden ratio. To find both of these numbers together on the same diagram and in relation to a simple triangle completely surprised me, and it seems like a bizarre coincidence. Anyway, to close out this explanation, it helps to show the reconstruction of VA, VB, and VC using the V1 and V2 phasers that were just extracted geometrically. Then when V2 rotates 360 degrees, it becomes clear how these symmetrical component values provide a great tool for recreating any type of imbalance in a set of phasers. To understand the symmetrical components for systems with more than three phases, it helps to start with two phases again and review what's been built from there. 
For two phases, the value minus one, which is one half a turn around the complex unit circle, is given a letter designation called alpha. Operations are performed with alpha to calculate unbalance that represents distances from the midpoint of the system to other points. With three phases, alpha has a different value representing one third of a turn around the complex unit circle. To find the symmetrical components, powers of alpha are multiplied against the three phasers. In this scene, I placed an alpha to the fourth term because it's actually more correct and V2 is really measuring the double rotation speed of the system. However, since powers of alpha only take on one of three values in the complex plane, the alpha to the fourth term reduces to alpha to the power of one. This change makes V2 look like a reverse of V1's rotation instead of a doubling. The resulting matrix will provide the phasers connecting the geometric center of the system to other points, such as the triangle centroid or the vertices of the Napoleon triangles. For four phases, the same pattern is repeated. Alpha is equal to one quarter of a turn around the complex unit circle, which is just the imaginary number i. The transformation matrix measures zero, one, two, and three times the fundamental speed of the system. Here again, the powers of alpha can be reduced to simpler terms. The V0 component tells a similar story as before, giving the phasor that connects to the center of the system. The V1 component gives a measure of the positive rotation in the system, similar to the three-phase case. The V2 component this time gives a set of vectors that are bipolar, just like in the two-phase case, and there is no specific rotation direction associated with this component. The V3 component ends up being equivalent to the negative rotation component of the system similar to what V2 was in the three-phase case. The symmetrical component equations for any number of phases can be found in a pretty straightforward way. For n phases, alpha is the complex value that's one nth turn around the complex unit circle. The V0 component will always measure the distance from the system's neutral to the geometric center of the system. From there, the powers of the alpha term take on integer multiples of the component being measured. So for V1, the powers of alpha are one, two, three, and so on. And for V2, the powers are two, four, six, etc. And the pattern continues. If the number of phases are even, then there will be a middle component halfway down the list that gives a set of bipolar phasers like what was shown in the two and four phase cases. All of the components before the middle measure different rates of positive rotation, and the components after the middle measure different rates of negative rotation. The types of rotation become very interesting as the number of phases increases. For example, this scene is illustrating an unbalanced 12-phase system with its associated components. There are a lot of interesting types of rotation to explore here, but I think this is where I have to stop. To go any deeper into what's going on here would take a whole other video. If you want to explore more about 12 phases or any of the other simulations from this video, please check out the GeoGebra simulators I've linked in the description. A lot more can be learned from playing with these simulators yourself rather than just watching a video about it. Thank you to everyone who stuck around to this point. If you liked the video, please leave a thumbs up or a comment, or if something didn't make sense, drop a question. If you're a power engineer and think that I could have explained something better, please also leave a comment. Symmetrical components is an important topic that needs to be explained well, and your input is valuable.